So it is 7.37 p.m. It is November 16th, 2021. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. <coughs> Pat, you're on mute. Are you here? There we go. I'm back off mute. Oh, sorry. I'm here. <laughs> Wonderful. Not, not entirely, as you can tell, but I'm here. Oh, good. Uh, Kevin Mills. Here. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Revlack. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening. Um, and so assisting us from the town is Kelly Linema. She had to jump off to start another meeting in town, but she'll be back on. Apparently, there are 13 meetings going on in town today. So uh, she's assisting another group getting up and running, and then she'll be back. Um, and then uh, joining us, our beloved uh, consultant, Paul Haverty. Paul, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public may follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video webinar via the Zoom webinar application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Uh, so uh, many of you who are <clears throat> uh, participating will note that I am apparently the only person who at the moment has live video. Uh, there's Zoom has, our understanding is that Zoom had a, a, an update to uh, their software and until everyone has had an opportunity to reinstall Zoom or to at least update Zoom, um, some of the video features have been disabled. So most of the business will be conducted this evening. Uh, we will not be uh, relying on sort of face-to-face -face communication more. It's gonna be discussion over documents. So I appreciate everybody's indulgence to allow us to, uh, to continue this meeting as we're, um, the board has certain time constraints with regards to uh, this evening's business. So um, <clears throat> turning to uh, item two on our agenda this evening, uh, which is the continuation of the discussion of the draft decision for Thorndike Place. Uh, at, our, at our October 20, 2021 public hearing, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place. This marked the end of the acceptance of new testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40-day period for the board to consider and render its decision. On October 28, 2021, the board initiated its deliberations. They were continued on November 3rd and November 11th, and we continue them again this evening. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly, but the board is unable to accept comment from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, the town, or the public. For this reason, tonight's meeting is being conducted using the webinar platform, which allows the board to limit who may participate in the discussion. And on behalf of the board, I appreciate everyone's understanding. The board will resume its discussion using the draft decision available on tonight's agenda. It can be differentiated by the text in the footer, noting an 11-11-21 revision date. The board will briefly review the revisions proposed at the previous meeting, then resume the discussions with the findings, um, discussing proposed revisions and a few proposed substitutions. And at the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting to continue its deliberations. Under state regulations, the board must issue a decision by November 30th or request an extension from the applicant to further continue its deliberations. So with that, <clears throat> so 
So this is the, uh, the 1111 draft that is on the town's website. Um, at the last hearing, we started with the H's. Um, and we continued through with those until uh, the end of the eyes. Yeah. So apart from um, some recent uh, some recent information that uh, Mr. Mills was looking up this afternoon, are there any questions about what we had done in terms of H the H's and the I's? No. So there are a few items here that we were still intending to come back and review again. Um, I-18 being one of those. Um, I-27. I-30. I-36. Oops, excuse me, we also did J last time. So we can do, um, so at this point we can either go back and um, start in with some of the, the questions that we had had on the I section um, that Mr. Mills was looking into on our behalf today, or we can uh, start with the findings and then come back to the conditions. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'd suggest that we, particularly since we have Mr. Haverty here and we won't have him here on Thursday, that we take advantage of the opportunity to go as far as we can on the conditions first and then turn to the uh, findings afterwards. Perfect. Okay. So then I'll go ahead. All right, so this is 18. Um, so I-18, so there's a, there's a question that we had from before as to whether I-18 and C2K were redundant um, in regards to what they were covering. So I had asked um, Mr. Mills if he could look into a few of these uh, these potential conflicts between earlier sections and the I section to see if there are in fact were conflicts or if there were things that he felt we should continue to include in both. Um, <clears throat> so for I-18, um, describes, so we're, they're both, so I-18 and C2K both deal with locating the groundwater elevation in general. Um, so I-18 is looking for the site using, in general, using prescribed methodologies and C2K describes confirming the seasonal high groundwater elevation specifically at the stormwater basins. So the question before the board was then, did we want to maintain both sections or did we want to uh, work on combining them? And I recall, Last time, part of the question was in I-18, is this the phrase at the start, notwithstanding the provisions of condition to uh, C2K? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so I wonder if, if uh, Mr. Mills could explain to us his recommendation as to what to do with this one. So I recall he had one. Mr. Mills? 
Well, they seem to be different patterns. One was the first one, uh, I-18, I should say, uh, goes into great depth and detail about how the methods should be done for measuring um, the water table, if you will, throughout the site. And that's not really defined. And I'm not, you know, up on all these methods. The next section specifically um, recommended monitoring uh, where the uh, drainage pits will be uh, specifically and to uh, see if it agrees with the previous borings. So it looked like one was just to generally look at the whole site and the other was to look at just where they're gonna have the drainage area and confirm uh, that it, the uh, other readings are generalized to that specific site. So I do think they're different. What is the, Mr. Chairman, if mm -hmm. Mr. Mills or Mr. Haverty can, I'm not quite sure I understand what the, what the work is that's being done by notwithstanding the provisions of conditions C2K. So I, I think that is probably me who added that. And it was basically to imply that C2K would hold, but that what was coming up in I-18 would not, super, not, would not supersede what was required under C2K, but would be an adjunct to it. I see. I would say that probably most lawyers would read it exactly the opposite. Ah, okay. They would they would say notwithstanding, in other words, C2K doesn't apply. What applies here is I18. That sort of is what usually notwithstanding the provisions of C2K would mean. And I think mm -hmm. what your intention is is that both imply. Yes. That this doesn't somehow preempt C2K. I agree with Pat, and that first sentence, notwithstanding, could be eliminated, and the rest of C2K could stand on its own. The applicant shall through the documentation, I think is how that section should start. I wonder, does Mr. Haverty ever have a view? I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that the notwithstanding the provisions of condition C2K supersedes C2K. Um, I think that this is intended to basically say that C2K stands on its own and that this condition imposes, you know, if it imposes requirements above and beyond, that it's not limited to the requirements of C2K, but so, probably draft it so that it's a little clearer. Mr. Chairman, I, I, would it be better to say in addition to the provisions of C2K? I, I think it might. Oh, yes. Oh, not limited by the, you know, the provisions of condition C2K. That sort of thing would be helpful to me because I, I, I must say I was led to the wrong conclusion by the notwithstanding clause. And so I may not be the only one. So it would, though any of those alternatives would be okay as far as I'm concerned. So if we said not limited to the provisions of condition C2K, the applicant shall, and then go on. I, quite honestly, I, can you hear me? We can pass. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I'm not lighting up on the board. I, I like something more along the lines of what uh, Mr. Hanlon suggested, in addition to the provisions of C2K, because not limited to, again, sounds a little bit sort of in between. You know, I, I think it may raise those same questions as notwithstanding. So okay. I'd rather just have it say, in addition to the pro provisions. <clears throat> you know, set forth in condition C2K, the applicant shall. I agree with that as well, Mr. Chairman. I will switch it to, so do here, and so in addition to the provisions of condition C2K. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so I think that that in what may very be the least controversial question that we have before us tonight, I think there should be a quotation mark, an end quotation mark at the end of this paragraph. 
the, the whole part starting with the word estimate is oh. a quotation from the handbook and we don't have a uh, close quotes. Okay. So we think it goes to, we'll take yep. it to the very end. Yep. Okay. Okay. So then I will move on from eight. Excuse me, before we go further, <clears throat> I have a question for Paul. Yes, the please. second section there, C2K, did not go into a great deal of uh, detail on how the testing mm -hmm should be conducted as it did in I-18. Mm -hmm. uh, should we be going into more detail or is that sufficient? It's not my area of expertise. It just seemed to be lighter, if you will. Well, ultimately they're going to be doing the test pits consistent with condition I-18 because it's essentially for the same purpose. It's for the stormwater basins. So I don't think you need to repeat it in C2K. But, but you might want to say that, I mean, in C2K, the applicant shall perform additional test pits consistent with the methodology set forth in condition I-18. Exactly. Thank you. That sounds good. Yeah, then you're just cross-referencing the two. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So I think the last time we looked at this paragraph, there was also a question where you start off with, if it is difficult to determine the seasonal high groundwater elevation, does anyone remember that coming into question at the last meeting? Yeah, they're talking about the Frimpton methods. Yeah, and what I was thinking, and, and perhaps uh, Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Hanlon, you know, as experienced litigators could probably comment on this, but where I read, if it is difficult to determine, to me, that's like I go out there, it's a rainy day and my boots get stuck in the mud. And so it's difficult, as opposed to if the seasonal high groundwater elevations uh, cannot be determined with a reasonable degree of precision or certainty or something more along those lines. And maybe I'm splitting hairs, but you know that seems to me that if, when you say is if it's difficult to determine, that seems to me that you're referring to the actual process as opposed to the outcome, which is the reasonable degree of precision or certainty. So I, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking it, but that was kind of how th that, uh, that whole uh, sentence uh, struck me. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. In principle, I agree with Mr. Um, DuPont's remark, but the provision in here, if it is difficult to determine, is not our language. It's quoted, it's in the middle of a quotation from the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook, which is going to apply no matter what we say. So it seems to me here that it might be better just to stick with the language yeah. that's already in the regulations. Thank you for pointing that out. I completely lost sight of that. Okay. Come back to... So under K, was this the what was recommended? Utilizing the methods detailed in condition I-18, the applicant shall perform additional test pits. Is that the correct adjustment for C2K? Works for me. Looks good. Okay. <clears throat> and, Usually we just raise our thumbs, but we can't do that tonight. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so this next one here. So this is I-27 and C1F. So Kevin, I don't know if you want to explain this one a little bit. Okay. I gotta expand that if my glasses on thank you. <laughs> I can make it bigger. Yeah, um, I-27 is redundant with C1F. So I think we stay with C1F. 
uh, and get rid of I-27. Okay. And you were recommending a, an amendment to the first sentence? Yeah. Because that was that operational phrase, if you will, was included in I-27, but wasn't in C-1F. You know, C1F just started out, does the applicant must provide a compensatory flood storage plan? I said the applicant shall submit for review and administrative approval by the board a restoration plan and then continue on for the compensatory blah, blah, blah. So does the compensatory flood storage plan already include a restoration plan? Yes. when you get down to four, five, and six. Paul, do you have any issues, concerns with that? No. Nope. I will jump back again. Submit to review and approval by the board. Compensatory flood storage mitigation plan. So we're looking to do? Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. And then I need to go back down. The eyes. So that just can be deleted in my opinion. So we will remove that. And then I did want to go back quickly up because I think there was some other. C1. So there was that change and then All right, meant we had wanted to put in that the it was a that the maintenance would continue in perpetuity. I think that does not occur elsewhere in here. All right. So on that was twenty seven. So the next one is I thirty. So again, Kevin, if you could just outline this for us. Again, um, they're largely redundant in uh, C1F is more detailed and comprehensive. So I thought we would just make a few edits to uh, C1F 
Okay. And all the intended information would be there. And that was the change under sub six here? Yes. Um, I took out the line with healthy plants of identical species and similar size. Um, you know, if the original plants didn't live, putting in the same identical plants is not a good idea, as most gardeners would agree. You know, for whatever reason, whatever you plant in there is not making it. You're going to go for another plant that has the same goal, but, you know, a different species for whatever reason. And then um, I put in that additional information the applicant must admit that was from I-30. Mm, okay. Put in some of the different vocabulary, I mean, different words from I-30 into this one. Any questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so the question I have has to do with sort of, as I recall, C is all has to do with providing certain ish, certain reports at a at an early time. It's yeah, but specifically plans. So they have to outline what they're intending to do. Correct. There is, is C is generally about submission requirements, and. C1 is about prior to any construction or site development activities, uh, whether or not pursuant to a uh, permit, the applicant is supposed to do a whole bunch of things. Um, and I guess the question I have is, is and maybe Mr. Haverty could express an opinion on this, is whether moving language in I-30 that is directly, that doesn't have anything to do with plans and is just directly applied to the applicant into C1F, which is talking about providing a plan, which plan will eventually be binding on the applicant, whether in, in, in making that change in location, we are losing anything that we don't want to lose. Did you have any? I, I mean, I, I see Mr. Hanlon's point. You know, the, the, the conditions in C1F are designed to be the requirements, you know, for a pre-building permit. So you're supposed to be getting all this stuff before you pull a building permit. I, I mean, if you include it as a requirement somewhere else, it, it's still a requirement. They would still technically be supposed to do it before they pull a building permit. The question is, does it get overlooked if it's not within the, the list of conditions required to obtain building permits. So I do see that concern. Mr. Chair. Turnlack. I've to I've looked through the this compared these two as well. And I I felt I felt like there was a the two had different scopes. So C1F seems to be, you know, largely concerned with the compensatory flood storage area, mm -hmm. where, but whereas I-30 doesn't have that qualification. I mean, it's in the I section, which is wetlands, floodplain, and environmental conditions. But I, it, to me, it seemed like I-30 um, had a broader area of applicability than, um, yeah, then C1F. Steve, the one thing I think I have to take a look at the whole I area because the last sentence does re uh, mention the compensatory flood storage area uh, specifically. That being said, I do agree <laughs> with Pat's assessment that perhaps, you know, um these two things should be separated yeah that yeah and that was another thing i had written down is that the the last sentence that of i-30 that deals specifically with the compensatory flood storage area seems like it should go someplace else <laughs> okay so if since switching from this version to 
this version here. So, <clears throat> um, so in section six, um, the original was the applicant must submit proposed recommendations for a placement to the board for its review and administrative approval. Uh, applicant shall submit the contact information prior responsible for monitoring dispensary flow storage area. Um, and then, so it seems to me that we could maintain this in C1F sub six, um, but then also maintain I30. Fine. Oops, get down to I30. But just an I30. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes. If you just delete the words within the compensatory flood storage area, then that last sentence in red seems to me to work fine. Select all of a sudden. Such as that. Anything further on this one? Mr. Chairman, yep. you Sorry. guys are following this, I think, better than I. Why wouldn't we in the I section just say we should be just you keep in the condition to address Mr. Hanlon's concern that they follow the plan with section C and just so there's no duplicative language? That or is that not enough? So I think that. The concern was that C1F is specific to um, the compensatory flood storage area, whereas I30 is a more general. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just to be clear, I, I'm not 100% sure that there really is a gap between the two. There may not be, but I think that it's a good idea just as a kind of a catch-all clause that if there's anything that falls in the cracks, I30 mm -hmm. should be there to pick up, you know, to pick up on it. And if it turns out that there isn't anything in the cracks, then no harm is done. Okay. I agree. So then as, as shown here, this I-30, we're good with. Yes. Perfect. Okay, then I will grab I-36. So again, Mr. Mills, if you don't mind giving us- And again, this may be the same problem where one is general and, uh, you know, I really didn't pick up on that to be honest, uh, with a CI, E and G sections may be just uh, particular to the uh, flood condition. I mean, the uh, compensatory storage, where I may be more broad. So maybe I may be incorrect in assessing I 36 be struck out. A little odd that I-36 starts off as if it was a finding, which it's not. An adequate quantity of vegetation. I, I see one E already talks about an adequate quantity of vegetation for areas under the jurisdiction of section 24. And then we already have something that they have to submit to invasive species plan. So I think I would agree with, with Mr. Mills' initial assessment. If we have C1E and C1G, then I-36 mm -hmm. is really just duplicate. The first sentence duplicates one and the second sentence duplicates the second. 
Mr. Chair, I came to generally the same conclusion as well. I go back now to our main. Going back to that again, please, could you put it up? Yep. With um, Pat's previous comment about specificity, maybe from the uh, I section, you want to strike out the phrase relating to the aura. So I think in I-36, we were going to strike I-36, I think. Totally? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Other is also there. I twenty seven we covered. I eighteen we covered. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I think one of our question marks uh, from earlier was in section C one I V. This was the all electric. Section. Yes, indeed. Right. I would like to make a proposal. Now let me go C one I Mr. Chair, I did find a reference from Ms. Noyes committing to that. I put that in another re uh email. What was your proposal, Mr. Revelac? That we do uh have a con that we do apply the all electric re requirement to the duplexes mm -hmm. you know my thinking is you know for us our concern is whether we propose a condition that is challenged as making the um project uneconomic and i mean based on some of the information distributed uh, a while ago when we were working on you know having the clean heat article brought mm -hmm. to town meeting um i came away from that with the understanding that, you know, at least air source heat pumps are, you know, a, in the same general price range as, you know, other, as conventional heating and as other forms of heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of get the sense that the applicants might want to just do it anyway. Yeah. So I would, I would suggest we make the, I would suggest making the all electric requirement uniform throughout the project. How do people feel about that um, as applying everywhere? And I guess because the, the part of the question would be, would it obviously it would apply to not only heating, but also uh, to the heating of hot water and to any cooking appliances? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I'm sort of nervous about this, but <laughs> we are now dealing with uh, with a provision in, in the town bylaws that I was a major proponent of. And so it's very, it's embarrassing not to, not to be all out for it. Um, but the word, the bylaw that we passed actually uh, would allow for a gas hookup for cooking. Um, and I think that Mr. Revelak is quite right with respect to water as well. The, the issue with respect to water is primarily in large apartment buildings uh, and not in, in, uh, uh, and not in, uh, in the duplexes. I do note though that there's a lot of word out there that to the general effect that, that there's a relative shortage of people who really are, know how to handle the, the heat pumps in the appropriate way. And I'm sure that the applicant could find people who would testify to practically 
anything here, not because they're dishonest, but because people have different perspectives on this and different degrees of experience. So I'm a little bit worried about it from that point of view, and I'm worried about it even more if there's anything that we know that we do not have the authority on our own hook to uh, impose, it would be this requirement because even town meeting didn't have that authority. Mm -hmm. And until the state legislature uh, either uh, adopts our home rule petition or this, the Department of, Envir of Energy Resources uh, adopts some sort of a, of a net zero building code, um, we're in a situation where, where it seems to me legally that's vulnerable. And the main thing that we have going for it is the possibility that nobody will pay any mind because it doesn't matter that much economically. Um, and so I'm just a little bit nervous about mm -hmm. rock, rocking the boat. And I wonder if Mr. Haverty could just give us his assessment uh, of this, because I remember at an earlier point, there was a different provision that uh, with that had to do with uh, imposing unequal unequal conditions that I thought he had said could be appealed even in the absence of making the project uneconomic. And I wonder what what it would be our position here if we adopted mm -hmm. Mr. Revelak's suggestion and then the applicant tried to appeal just that. Could they do that? So if the, the provision to be adopted is something that is not applicable to unsubsidized housing developments in Arlington, then it would be subject to being stricken by the HAC if there were an appeal, mm -hmm. irrespective of whether it contributed to rendering the project uneconomic. Um, again, I mean, I, I think that the Mr. Hanlon's point is very well taken that if the town felt that it could not go so far as to include that as a requirement in the zoning bylaw, then it's not appropriate to include it as a condition in this decision. In this situation where the applicant has themselves in multiple meetings said they're intending for the project to be all electric, it's still a problem at that. Okay. The applicant has committed to using all electrical services for the project. If you add a provision that states that if the applicant wishes to change to something other than electric service, then it shall follow the procedure set forth in 760 CMR 56.0511 for modifications of comprehensive permits. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I could just, I had, I had, I focused on this too, obviously, and I have some language that, that would do sort of more of what I have in mind. And ultimately we have to decide, you know, what to do here. But I would have said, um, the applicant has committed to using all electric service for um, the senior residential building. If any gas service is to, provide, to, to be provided for an emergency generator or other similar facility or for the duplexes, a gas service location shall be included on final plans. And I guess the, the, the underlying thing here is that, you know, until, until the duplexes came back, they weren't really talking about that. And in the material that Mr. Mills turned up, the question had to do with the residential building, that is to say the other, the multifamily building that is the, is the heir um, um, to that. And, um, and the question didn't come up with respect to the duplexes. So I feel pretty comfortable about holding the applicant to its word when it comes to the multifamily aspect mm -hmm. of it. It's only with respect to the duplexes that I feel that we're getting beyond what they made representations for. Um, and so I, I would like to jawbone them and would do that in a finding that, that we talk about later on. Um, but I was nervous about doing something that would, that would, uh, uh, that would have the problems I discussed a moment ago. Mm -hmm. I... I was going to say, I like the language Mr. Hanlon suggested a few moments ago uh, for, emergent, if it, uh, for emergency generation to emergency generator or similar facility or to the duplexes. Mm -hmm. 
because the, the other question I had is I know the applicant has expressed that in the in your living building there and intending on having a, the possibility of a food service for um, at least one meal a day. And I do not know the current status of electric commercial kitchenware and whether something like that is possible to uh, to do electrically or whether you know something like that would have to rely on gas. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, I do believe with the introduction of induction technology and cookware, uh, you can create dishes as hot or faster with electricity than you can with gas at this time. Mm -hmm. I don't think that'd be a limiting function. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. My understanding is that in some restaurant situations, particularly, you know, the your grilled steaks and things like that, that, that there's some resistance by the restaurant industry. Um, but I'm just going to go with, with my view would be to go with what Ms. Noyes said, and she didn't make any qualification uh, with respect to using all electric for the, uh, for the senior residences. She made the commitment that it should apply to the senior, you know, to, to the, the question was generally to the building. Mm -hmm. And the answer was that she did continue the commitment she had made before to that. Um, and, you know, it seems to me that, that it, I don't really necessarily see any reason to, to ask of her less than she offered. So you would you recommend then changing the word project to yes senior residential building should replace project. And that I think is consistent with what Mr. Mills discovered when he went back and looked at the record. So we so would this then be the final language? For me, <laughs> it's up to the rest of the board. I'm good. I'm good. Also, all right. Okay, Charles, this is staff that we've been discussing. As I we discussed last time. All right. That may be it for the conditions. Other ones that I had flagged at the end of last time. One was D16, which we still haven't come to a full conclusion on, which is the construction hours. Uh, and particularly, we're not stabilizing it on the Saturday. Um, and the other was D31. Um, and the, so I did look, so I, I did find to, the general laws that hold for protection of, of what we've been referring to as street trees is chapter 8712. But that refers to them not as street trees, but as public shade trees. Um, so I think we should make that change. Mr. Chairman, is, is, is public shade trees a defined term? Do we know what the difference is between the two? Um, so public shade tree is the term that's used in that in the under mass general law for protection of public trees and refers to trees that are bordering on streets. So I, 
I can't recall off the top of my head if it's specifically defined a term. Um, is so chapter um, 87, section one defines public shade trees as all trees within a public way or on the boundaries thereof, including trees planted in accordance with the provisions of section seven, shall be public shade trees. And when it appears in any proceeding in which the ownership or rights in the tree are material to the issue, that from the length of time or otherwise, the boundaries of the highway cannot be made certain by records or monuments. And for that reason, it is doubtful whether the tree is within the highway. It shall be taken to be within the highway and to be public property until the contrary is shown. So basically any tree within the layout is presumed to be a public shade tree. Okay. So then the only remaining um, question in the conditions then is the, the construction hours question. So with that in mind, are we comfortable moving on to findings? Uh, Mr. Chair, I can propose a resolution to the construction hours. Okay. Um, and or we or if you'd prefer I hold my tongue, I'm happy to hold my tongue. <laughs> I, if we can if we can close this question, I would be happy to do so. So I reviewed the um, public I reviewed my notes of the um, hearing where this uh, where we discussed this. Mm -hmm. uh, the last public hearing. Um, I counted nine members of the public who provided testimony. Uh, four opposed work on weekends and holidays. And five did not express a preference. So my, you know, my sort of my proposal for this is then, um, you know, the, the neighbor, I believe the uh, you know, initially, I think the applicant w w was interested in having the option of doing construction throughout the weekend, and the um, the abutters did not wanted the opposite. Um, so I, I think splitting it, sort of as it's worded now, where um, there are hours allowed on Saturday but not on Sundays or holidays, um, would be a reasonable thing to do. Other members forward think. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I agree with Mr. Revelak. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. What are the general statutes as it relates to construction activities in general? Is there a specific? So in uh, town, the construction hours are governed by the noise ordinance. And? And those are uh, eight to six, Monday through Friday, and nine to five, Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Oh. Yeah. I'm surprised it includes Sunday and holidays. Thank you. Yep. Mr. We have the problem of limiting um, this uh, project, you know, saying it's just an affordable project, if you will, and if we're not limiting other projects, what limitations did we put on Mass Avenue? Um, so Mass Ave, I don't think we adjusted the hours, um, but there was a specific request and a discussion during the hearing between uh, ourselves and the applicant in regards to the work hours, because they were they had wanted to shift the weekday hours earlier. And so we had sort of a discussion with them and you know, discussing that this is at the back of a residential neighborhood with only access through the residential neighborhood um, that we could, we would consider shifting the work, the weekday work hours earlier um, in exchange for removing Sunday hours. And I believe in my notes it, it I have it that they had at least tacitly agreed to that. 
Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I thought that something was was like that in the discussion here as, as well. It was a little bit less precise, but uh, it was clear that Mr. Klipko was very attracted by the idea of having somewhat more flexibility on the weekdays uh, and was actually willing to give up a little bit on the end of the weekdays in order mm -hmm. to be able to use his construction crews in a more efficient way. And so I have viewed this all along as being a kind of a negotiation, if you will, between the applicant and, and residents of the community to find something that is beneficial to the applicant. That's a win-win situation, right? That the applicant is, is benefited by some part of it and not by other parts of it. And you come to a resolution that, that makes sense. Uh, and I do think that that was, that was certainly at the end of that meeting, what I had come away with is that uh, there was flexibility on the applicant's part. And really the, the hard part was just defining exactly where the, where the line should be drawn. Mm -hmm. um, and I must say that, it, that based on my memory, the, <clears throat> the uh, provision that is in the current red line for D16 comes pretty close to what I thought was acceptable to the applicant and, and represented something that made, if not everybody happy, everybody a little happier than they were before. So are we comfortable with maintaining the regular Saturday hours or was there any concern about that? Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would not, for the reason I just said, this is mm -hmm. kind of a fine tuning sort of thing and I wouldn't push our luck. If yep. we can get Saturdays and holidays, I'd be happy to get that, to get that much. Otherwise, I think we're back to where we were before. The applicants have to start at eight, but they get to work all through the weekend. And I, I don't think that would be, that would be advantageous to this neighborhood getting a couple of days of rest would be or one every week and an additional one every once in a while yeah. would, would be a definite benefit for the community. Okay. And I do have a note from, from Mr. Haverty earlier on that, whereas this is a variation from what's in our town bylaws that we should also add a waiver um, to cover this change. Mm. Correct. I still have that in my notes. All right, so we'll leave this as it is then. We're, we're okay with that. Jump up to the top. Have any questions on the procedural? The public hearing was closed on the twenty first. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, well, in the area that you've just got there, um, I'm wondering whether we, my general sense is that we have a provision and maybe I'm just wrong about this and that Mr. Haverty should straighten me out. Um, but I thought that A2 would be the final proposed project and I mean, when we get to that, we've got a whole things. And I think that it's a, it, it's not really a very good idea to repeat something as fundamental as what the project is in more than one location. And I don't really see what, what the, <clears throat> the language that you have marked out there um, adds and, and why it is that it would be desirable to have that rather than just to rely on the provision later on. Mr. Chairman, I agree with Mr. Hanlon. I think we're better off having it only identified in one spot. Okay. 
if you wanted to call it out, you could certainly cross-reference the condition that identifies it. So you could say, you know, the, the final site plans are identified in condition A, whatever. We were to so. Condition A. I think it's specifically A2. The chairman. I believe yes, condition A2, yes. I was just going to say what you've already put in there. I guess we would still say the proposed project is depicted on the final plans listed in condition eight. No, it's not the final plans, those are the approved plans. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> All right, Pat, I lost you. Oh, I'm sorry, am I here? Yep, I can hear you now. Okay, um, I, I was wondering, I mean, well, I was ready to go on to paragraph, um, paragraph 13 if you're ready to do that. Sure. Uh, could we stop at 12 along the way? Okay. Certainly. Uh, so in the one, two, three, fourth line, there's a plan numbered, it, it's written as C2-03. Oh. Uh, I believe that should be C-203. Oops. Yeah. And then 13. All right. The what I'm wondering is is why what did it what purpose is well actually the 13 i'm looking at is the one that's that's just off oh, the goodness. screen wall <laughs> i didn't realize we have 12 13 which is deleted and then 12 again which is a different 12 okay so are you talking this 13 yeah i'm talking about that 13 okay um so i'm not quite sure 
I understand the rationale for including all of the, by name, all of the submissions of the applicant, and then just generally referring to, and by the way, there are a bunch of beta peer review comments and the Conservation Commission and town departments and staff. Um, I guess I, I, I wonder uh, whether I would just delete the part starting the including uh, and just say the applicant provided additional detail and assessment of the revised con concept project plans um, and just leave it there. Uh, now, if in fact we wanted to have some, if, if I mean, an issue will come up later on as to whether to include reference in this, in this. and if we did, you, we might want to have an appendix that actually listed uh, that listed the key or so, or the the things that were referred to, but other than that, I don't really see why we have to. I mean, this this just goes to show how much work the consultants and Ms. Kiefer did, and that's not necessarily a uh, something that that is really part of this. Mr. Haven, is there any? issue in removing the dates? No, none at all. Uh, Pat, where were you intending to cut? Start after the word, after where that comma is after the word plans, I put a period and delete the whole rest. Of, just of that sentence or through the end of the? That is actually, there's that, that is the end of the sentence. Ah, okay. This may be the only suggestion that I'll make in this entire one that actually makes the document shorter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I have a suggestion on 14 as well. Okay. Um, I think that that 14 in 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 the Including one, the the, the opposite. Anyone who's lived through all of the hearings that we have would find that it was they were sort of weakly um, described by saying during the extensive public hearing process there was significant public input, including strong local opposition. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that what I went lived through was a lot more consequential than that. Um, I remember that that at least one of the people who were commenting on this provision suggested that we indicate that there was op strong opposition also from the legislative delegation and from the, uh, the select board. Um, and I think that that's right. And that probably significant input from the Arlington Land Trust is a little bit underplaying exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would, I would at the very least rewrite this by including Ms. Keith, Keith Lewis's suggestion saying that the opposition included um, the legislative delegation and the select board. Um, maybe that's all that you need to do, but I, but I think that, that ultimately what anyone who sees this ought to understand is what we understand is that the universe, that the opposition to this project was nearly universal and that included both the legislators and it included the select board. And we ought to, and we ought to say more about that, that we shouldn't just say, oh, we received, we received correspondence from them as if, as if that correspondence didn't have a pretty strong theme in it.
Okay, so changing that last sentence then, to strong opposition was also expressed by the select board and the town state house delegation. Yes, Mr. Chairman, that, that would be helpful from my point of view. Um, but you had also mentioned we should be a little more explicit about um, the Arlington Land Trust and the Mystic River Watershed Association. Right. Significant, I, and again, I would say significant expressions of opposition or input and because it, some of it is quite constructive, actually. It wasn't yeah. just opposition, but. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'm wondering if those sentences should go up after the, or, or at the end of the first sentence. And, um, oh, oh, and I'm wondering whether the first sentence should say, instead of significant public input, just significant, uh, just say strong local opposition. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not married to it. My feeling was, was during the extensive public hearing process, there was strong local opposition. And then opposition from um, the select board and the uh, state house delegation. I'm welcome to hear thoughts from others. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps strong. Uh, there was a strong op strong opposition from the select board, the town state house delegation, and from local residents. Very good. I would probably lead with the residents because they're the most relevant to the inquiry, I think. That's fine. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. I wonder if, I, just, to make it, just to make it clear that it was not just strong local opposition, but broad opposition, I'd say something like many residents or, or I don't know, something that, that shows that we had, when you when you eliminate the significant public input, you're eliminating the reference to just how much testimony there was, and I'd like to have some word in there that that recognizes that it wasn't just a few people talking a lot; it was a lot of people talking over a long period of time. And, and maybe you leave it as as is, Mr. Chairman, because we may be overly wordsmithing it. Okay. So do we? want to proceed in this vein or do we want to go back to the way, way we had it? My opinion, the significant public input is fine. Then with the strong local, the broad strong local opposition, and you can add in the way you have it um, with, with the residents in the uh, slip button delegation. <clears throat> And maybe change local opposition to local. I'm sorry, remove the word local. <laughs> I said that Thank backwards. You. Sorry There's about that. in there and we only need one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have input twice in a row. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so the next thing that I have is, is also the note for deliberation. And if the board is willing, I'd like to explain where this came from. The part that's in red there, um, or the, that's shaded, in 15. Um, comes from Ms. Kiefer. And the part that's in blue uh, originally came from me when I, when I did all of this. And this will come up more in the suggestion that I made on transportation earlier on. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's only, one, there's only one application in front of us, only one proposal. 
Uh, that's the proposal for the senior living and the duplexes. Um, and the, the applicant's insistence on our comparing it with the proposal that they had just before they had this one is really changing changing the subject, or at least it's a diversion of the board from its task, which is to decide whether or not the balance between local concerns and uh, the, the regional need for housing are such as to justify uh, approving this project. Um, so I attempted to basically draw the, what I thought was the sting uh, in the first part of paragraph 15. Um, that does actually, though, it's not just a matter of looking at the, uh, uh, that it's better than in the past, but it includes a number of specific things that we will want to refer to at some point um, in, uh, in, in indicating what they've done uh, in order to address some of the concerns that we'll be getting into in more detail when we get into the specific factual findings. Um, I'm not sure that we actually um, need this paragraph at all. Um, and I'm, I don't wildly disagree, except for the notable improvement, which just seems to be excessive. Um, but so I would be happy to, to eliminate it. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I just, that's the reason why it is, it looks the way it does, where you get the first sentence says one thing and the second sentence largely takes it away. That's because the first sentence was written by one person and the other one was written by a person with a somewhat different perspective. I, I, I was gonna say uh, something similar to Mr. Hamlin and say we take out the whole paragraph. I don't think it's necessary for our decision. Mm -hmm. I concur. And also, uh, the end of 14, the last sentence there needs to be struck out. Strong opposition was also expressed by oh, the select dang. board. Because you set it up above. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I think just strike that out. But Mr. Chairman, let me, I should just emphasize that some of the specifics that we struck out here will need to be referred to when we get to the actual issues when we make our our findings we shouldn't lose it all because mm -hmm. uh and we won't lose, lose all of it but we should just keep in our mind that they've done a number of things and mm -hmm. we need to take into consideration the things that have been done to mitigate the uh the concerns that we will have okay and mr chair mm -hmm. i mean the only word um you know, with with 15 as a whole does not, I'm okay with. And, and even though it, there is an element of giving something and then one and then taking it back, <clears throat> um, I, I think that actually, you know, that, that, you know, actually captures a portion of, <laughs> you know, how the hearings went. Uh, but I d would like to see the word notable struck. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I don't think that this paragraph fits here at all anyway, because this is procedural history. And, it, and if you have, and it's gone now, but where you have a sentence that starts out the board finds, that's not procedural mm -hmm. history to me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought that at the bottom where Mr. Hanlon had constructed that last sentence, if you wanted something in there, you could say whether or not, or regardless of whether the final project is an improvement, it's the duty of the board. Because I do think at some point, it is important to say that, as was suggested, that there may be parts of this that have to go somewhere else, saying that there have been iterations, and some of them are probably uh, preferable to you know, what, was, what came before. But I just don't think that this whole thing fits there anyway, because I don't think a, it's a not a finding doesn't go mm -hmm. in this area. So I'd, I'd be good with taking it all out. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. DuPont just said more clearly than I did the reason why I suggested eliminating this paragraph. All right. Is anyone uncomfortable with removing it? No. So removed. 
Okay. Moves us on to jurisdictional finding. Um, and these are, I believe, mostly boilerplate. Um, a couple of minor things. I just added some commas after the years. Uh, so 16 is just project eligibility. 17 is the board did not meet its statutory minima. Um, somebody had provided this. Mr. Chairman, you could just put the data. I, I remember Ms. Ray gave us a date and we'll easily see it by doing any, a search of the email. Okay. I'll just, I'll leave it as it is right now because it's easy to find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the board asserted its claim. This is a as a uh, board appealed its decision October 15. The Housing Appeals Committee upheld the decision for Housing Committee development. And then, as this decision was not a final decision, the board was not able to pursue an appeal pursuant to 30A14 at that time. The board reserves its rights regarding the sale they harbor claim. Um, Mr. Haverty, is that so written appropriately? Yes. Okay. So if I want to get rid of my beautiful highlighting. Uh, the granting of the conference permit not result in commencement construction of more than one three tenths of one percent of the land area. And those are the remainder of those. Seventeen, eighteen. Yep. So that gets us to factual findings. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, we're getting close to a place where I have um, has had a suggested amendment, but not quite there yet. Um, what I would, I need to uh, absent myself for just a minute. Um, but it's when we get to paragraph twenty-one, I think that. Uh, that is the key thing. Yeah. But in any event, there's that, and I think that there's a provision, there's a reason for bringing up what now is paragraph 23 to include in here. Um, but I'll, I will be back in just a minute. Okay. Right. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, when we get to 19, I will have um, a proposal. Okay. Although it's changed since I wrote down what I was going to suggest. So let me see if I can reconcile this while uh, we wait for Mr. Hamlet. <laughs> These changes to 18 and 19, I believe, are mine because I was trying to, um, to address the language. Um, so 18, there's the, the term low lying has had several different terms um, over the different drafts um, and the, the issue is that the site has you know as we as we're well aware a portion of it um, is uh, not entirely within the floodplain or excuse me not entirely within the, the, the flood zone um, and then the remainder of the site is either within the flood zone or within a floodway um, and so this was just trying to have the language be a little more explicit about its condition. And then in 19, all I was trying to do was just, I think, trying to make it so that the, we referred to the duplexes and the apartment building in the same order consistently in the paragraph because it mm -hmm. sort of reversed itself.
Mr. Chairman, I'm back. Okay. So in your absence, I had just mentioned that in 18, um, I had added the final sentence there just to sort of clarify what the what low lying means in the first part of the sent of the paragraph. And then in 19, the recommendations I was making was just so that the paragraph, as it mentions both the duplexes and the apartments, that it refers to the duplex first and the apartment second every time it references them. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry. Um, I was wondering if the, 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 what the material that is right here is literally about the location of the project. And, and I think it's sensible to have something that just is about that. And that doesn't get into evaluating this or that thing. And it seemed to me that the, the material that's in paragraph 23 below this one is a useful set of facts that talks about the location and is really orients the reader to what's going on. And I, and I wondered if, if it would make sense to take that, which is the first uh, set paragraph in the wetlands and flooding section and, and, and bring it up here to, to set the stage. If we did that, I would, I would put it after between 19 and 20 but just because in the order in which we deal with this, wetlands comes before transportation. Okay. Um... Mr. Chair, may I bring up my proposal for finding 19? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I will provide the uh, the a, a an additional sentence for the end of the paragraph, which will need a little wordsmithing to mesh properly with what's before it. But we'll just start with the new sentence first. Okay. Um, so I would propose adding overall. The project is consistent with the zoning bylaws definition of the planned unit development district okay. and accept is waived comma and accept is waived comma the dimensional regulations for that district yeah, you know, and my rationale is, I guess you could say this, it's one of the incongruities that's been, you know, constantly in the back of my head throughout these entire proceedings, where if you, you know, read the definition of the district and you look at the district's dimensional regulations, this project is not a bad fit. Um, now, I understand that that being a member of a zoning board, I am guilty of thinking about things in, in terms of districts far more readily than I think of them in terms of neighborhoods. But um, I, I mean, to me, this is, I think I felt like a lot of the objections, you know, in terms of the, the size and scale of the project were really more directed at the bylaw than the project themselves. So, I mean, the, the plant, the PUD district regulations are something that we decided <laughs> our town meeting voted on them in the past and they've been on the books for you know over half a century at this point and i you know i i under i understand the the you know the numerous objections from you know all quarters but i you know there's there's a part of me that says that you know we've as a municipality have given this have set sort of allocated a purpose to the set of parcels and I, I do think there you know we there should be a little bit of an obligation to follow that mm -hmm. mr chairman yes sir um, 
So I hardly ever disagree with Mr. Revelak. So this is going to be a novelty for me. Um, but let me start off with the observation that this paragraph has now evolved in such a way that it's not really about the location of the project anymore. Uh, and for a reason that is similar to uh, a paragraph that we had before that what really wasn't procedural history, if it's worth making this point, it's not a point that um, that is, seems to me properly here. Um, second, I think that it's it's a little bit dangerous. I I'm not sure. I don't believe the rationale for originally making this a planned unit development had no had no relationship whatever to the kind of project that mm -hmm. we're in here, and it had no relationship to the all of the forces that we that are relevant to our decision. Um, I don't feel any sort of obligation to follow the principles of, of PUD in, in this particular case. Um, and, you know, if we are going to, uh, it is true that, that to a considerable extent, the, the dimensional requirements are met. Uh, the multifamily is only conditionally allowed and, and that's mm -hmm. what we're dealing with. Um, so I'm not quite sure I understand why it is that we have anything more to say about this than that it is currently located within a planned unit development. But this wouldn't be the place to go about making an argument about mm -hmm. what that what what that means and that generally and and particularly an argument that ends with a sentence that suggests that this is presumptively an appropriate thing to do, because I don't think it is presumptively mm -hmm. an appropriate thing to do, ex except in so far as the 40B framework uh, creates a certain presumption in favor of affordable housing. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I would concur with Mr. Halen on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there is so if there is concern with that addition, then I um you know I will concede to taking it out. regards to sort of trying to keep this paragraph related strictly to the location of the project, um, if I was to remove the highlighted portion and just leave the, the two sentences under 19, would that make sense or is that incomplete? Chairman, I would have no objection to that. I missed that, Mr. Chairman. Could you repeat that? Sure. So I was proposed. So we had one of the things we had discussed brief, um, briefly was sort of making sure that things that are under location of project, so 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, making sure that those items strictly relate to the location. And as such, in 19, the first two sentences relate to the planned unit development. You know, sort of the location in the planning unit development, but the remainder of that paragraph is much more descriptive about the buildings themselves. So I was saying if I was to erase the part that is highlighted and just leave the first two sentences in 19, would that be acceptable? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just let me point out that, that a discussion of height and excuse me, and uh, and its relationship to the PUD is perfectly appropriate when we get to the neighbor, you know, the compatibility with the neighborhood. Uh, and in fact, part of the purpose of the duplexes is, is to is supposed to be to increase the degree of compatibility. So, the substance of that does have a place to come up. It just isn't here. Okay. All right, and then 20, this is the paragraph that we had slid up. This is the former 23. Um, this relates to the location 
relative to the minimal bike path bike way. And access is from lake. And there's no direct access from route two. Brings us to 22, the former 21. And I believe, Mr. Hanlon, you had a recommendation. Kevin, I wonder, I especially think I need to have you put this up on the screen because I can't seem to locate. There it is. Um, I submitted uh, on Monday, I think. I've forgotten uh, a, a proposal to strike paragraph 21 and substitute something which the board should have before it. So I have one, is it the one from this morning? Uh, no, I, I, I did this okay. yesterday, I think, or maybe even the day before, but I think yesterday. Okay. Um, the beginning says strike paragraph 21 and substitute the following. I think I found the correct one now. It's called paragraph 21 substitute 111521 is the yep. name of it. Okay. Ah, boy. So under the circumstances, I probably, let me just tell you briefly what this is for. And meanwhile, those of you who can read faster than I can might figure out what it says. Um, the par existing paragraph 21, I think is, is originally originated with, with me with lots of amendments as this was always the case here. And it was aimed at a, trans or a uh, transit oriented development that the applicant really essentially has backed away from in this most recent iteration. Um, and so now we are dealing with a, a different set of things. For the reasons I said last time, it seemed to me that the best way to approach the findings of fact here are to relate each of them to um, a series of local concerns uh, and then to a, determine in each case how it is that the project does or doesn't uh, address those concerns. So the purpose of this is essentially to be a signposting paragraph, uh, to eliminate and to, excuse me, to list and to provide an order for um, the concerns that seem to me to be the major ones with occasionally a, a sentence afterwards uh, uh, that explains why it is it's a, it's a, it's a local concern. Uh, so if we decided to do this, it implies sort of mo moving things around a little bit and not necessarily a lot, uh, but moving things around a little bit and some providing some additional uh, categories uh, that we don't already have uh, here. Um, the beginning one would be the need for affordable housing. And Mr. Revelak has circulated, I think yesterday or the day before, a uh, proposal for that. And the main idea there is, is that we shouldn't be find ourselves in a position where we're arguing that affordable housing is something imposed upon us and is only relevant insofar as it competes with all the other things we care about. This is a community that cares a lot about affordable housing too, and we ought to be prepared to say that. Um, flooding and wetlands, we've, we've, we've dealt with a lot there. Um, climate change, I wanted to pull out a little bit for two reasons. One was to provide an opportunity to talk about building electrification in net zero, which, as it turns out, is, is at least something that this project is doing that is helpful in the overall scheme of things for uh, Arlington's policies towards climate change. And then to focus again, then back on resiliency, uh, looking at uh, the way in which uh, there are both pluses and minuses uh, for the project. Uh, and in particular, I would like to express a concern if the rest of the board agrees with this concern, 
that while we've done a lot better than the initial proposals and, and actually the applicant has more or less agreed with what the Conservation Commission has asked them to do, um, things are going to deteriorate. We're going to have more severe storms. The 100 year storm is going to get to be more, more often the 50 year storm and, and so on. And while there are some provisions for re resiliency that the, <clears throat> excuse me, resiliency that the project has, and, and I don't want to, to minimize that, I think that it's appropriate for us to say that we have some concern that when you run this, when you run climate change into the future, this project and to said lots of the rest of Arlington are not really fully prepared to deal with the future. So that's a reason for talking about climate change separately from talking about flooding and wetlands. Traffic and transportation, neighborhood compatibility are both things, subjects that are already uh, on our list and they may need a little reorganization, but they're there. And then we, we say a lot about construction impact event, impacts eventually, but we don't have a corresponding set of findings here about the concern. And it seems to me that a few paragraphs that, that mention that. Um, uh, I, I will say that probably uh, the construction of the approved project will involve bringing rather than brining large trucks. Although the idea of brining large trucks is very appealing. Totally uh, appealing. <laughs> And then finally, I'd like to turn back on the principle of Latin grammar that you come back with the strongest wor word at the end, uh, the question of open space and property management, which we dealt with a lot on the last day, which we deal with in various places through here and in the conditions, and which it seems to me we should take the opportunity to draw all together to explain what the issue is and to explain the way the board has dealt with it so that there's no there's there's no confusion. So if the board were willing to accept this as the basis, and you know, obviously not necessarily every single word of something that you've barely seen, uh, it would have an implication for the way in which we'd structure the rest of the findings of fact. And I think this does a does a nice job of sort of organizing. Um, the way that we approach the findings going forward. I agree, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Yes, agreed. Agreed also, thank you. I missed my thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I agree too, this is great, thank you. So if I was to grab all of this. back. This, right, it's the former 21, the current. Okay. Now this again is this notably question. Do we maintain this paragraph? Mr. Chairman, again, this is simply an attempt to do the summary, the summary of argument. I think that we should we should deal with with the let me just sort of say, I for the reasons we already talked about, I don't feel it's relevant to be talking about how this is how this relates to earlier proposals. 
uh, the earlier proposals were not things that were accepted then. They're things that have been withdrawn by now, and we and they're not of any concern to us anymore. So this is subject to the same objection as before. And there's also, however, the same point is that this is a summary of, of the conclusions. And so we shouldn't lose the substance. Um, but I don't think that that I think it's too it's too quick. We've got a lot more discussion before we can we can get to these conclusions. Agreed. If we get to them at all. So we would be essentially striking 22 in its current location and possibly reallocating it later on. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so Mr. Chairman, if, if we follow the organization that was previously set out, I think the next thing that comes up is Mr. Revelak's suggestions on, on um, affordable housing. Okay. So I should also say that I've got a suggested amendment here too, which is actually more technical than anything else, uh, but it might be useful to bring that up. I, it's yeah. redlined. Yours was just a minor edit on Steve's, is that correct? Yeah, what I've what I've done, yes, it is. It, well, okay. it's a technical effort. It, it includes a number of lines, mm -hmm. but the, the basic point of it is to avoid saying anything that undermines our position mm -hmm. that the uh, that we're we should, are entitled to safe harbor uh, because we comply with the general land area minimum uh, provision in in uh, the regulations, uh, and that's what all that in blue is is intended to do. Mm -hmm. The substance yeah. is pretty similar to uh, what the original substance was, I think. I I, bl I, uh, I think Mr. Hanlon's proposal is, um, you know, quite worthwhile. <laughs> so as you'll see that the part four, the fourth paragraph, which deals with um, all electric uh, will, will be is incorporated in a suggestion that I'll make sometime later on 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 climate change. Um, but if that accept if that suggestion is accepted, it wouldn't appear here. It would appear there. Has everyone had a, taken the opportunity to peruse this earlier? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm a little uncomfortable with the uh, language after the first. I, I kind of like the original language in paragraph 67. Um, I kind of feel like we're exceeding our authority as a board talking about the reasons, um, you know, getting into the minutiae of the shortfall of affordable housing. Um, I would respectfully go with the first sentence that in, in the new paragraph, number one, and then go right down to paragraph two and just say, nevertheless, the project, which is similar to the language in paragraph 67 as it exists. I think it's, I'm a little uncomfortable going that far talking about this much detail as a zoning board. Thank you. Just trying to find where nevertheless was. We go right after the, right at the beginning of the start of uh, paragraph two. Okay. You would be removing the portion I've highlighted in blue. Yes.
How do other members feel? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Dubon. So I, I had questions. I wasn't necessarily in disagreement, but I was trying to clarify the rationale behind some of the language. So in the um, second sentence, there's another nevertheless there. Nevertheless, the town falls far short of meeting the town's, town's old, own goals for affordable housing. When I read falls far short, I, I, when it says goals for affordable housing, I think, are we referring back down to those other statistics that are defined in the town's current housing production plan? Is that what is that what that relates to? Because I wasn't clear on that. Mr. Revelak? So, actually, is that my line? Was no, that Mr. Just, Chairman, I this oh, it's right, in blue, so it was my language. In my and intention. Mr. And was, I forgive me, Mr. Chairman. I, I meant to say that after the word "nevertheless," you then go down to paragraph two. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the making a finding that the town fell short of its own goals. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, forgive me. Sorry about that, Mr. Hanlon. And and I don't, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I don't I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea to say that the um, you know affordable uh, the percentage of uh, affordable housing in Arlington is 5.64 percent I mean if that's a fact as of some uh, legitimate source that's a fact um, and, and you know which does not comport with the statutory minimum of 10 percent I don't have any problem with that being in there to sort of lay out where we stand today um, the rest of it, with respect to the housing production plan, I don't know maybe if that should be someplace else, but I, I think that I would not have that language from the town's current housing production plan necessarily in this area. Um, you know, because the... It, and the other question I guess I have, and this is sort of more a lawyer question is, when we relate to, when we refer to this housing uh, production plan, is that something that we are able to refer to uh, according to the requirements of the decision we're making? Because it's actually something that's published within the town. And I guess that's a question for Mr. Haverty. Is this like judicial notice that we're taking of something that is part of the you know corpus of town laws i wasn't clear on that i mean I, I certainly think that you have the ability to take notice of a document that has been adopted by the town all right mr chairman mm -hmm. point out that it's also been approved by the state right um so I, partly if i could just continue it, it I mean, there are two things. One is, is that the town's goal is actually not 10%. Uh, the town has never actually glommed on to any particular thing. And 10% is something you pick up by analogy um, from 40B itself. Um, it does seem to be, it did seem to me, the purpose is really to say that the town falls far short of meeting the town's own goals for affordable housing. And those of us who've been really active on the affordable housing front, I think know just how true that is. Uh, and at every town meeting, there's a huge amount of activity uh, that is designed to figure out the way in which we, uh, uh, the way in which we can make some progress in, in this regard. Much too much to be really specific here. So looking at the, the, the provision, the sentence about 5.64% is really bringing forward something that was said earlier in the jurisdictional statements and attracted no notice from us. Um, I think of the town's current housing production plan as, uh, as providing another example of the way in which there, there, are, there is a difficulty uh, and feel actually more comfortable with just saying the fact that we have uh, 1,121 affordable units and over 5,000 potentially eligible households 
um, is enough. But if you read the housing production plan, it's a rather long document, which demonstrates far more than this example does, just how far short we were then, and we're not any better off now uh, in meeting the town's own objectives. And that's really the point of this, is that apart from the objective that is established by state law, um, the town is still struggling to do better uh, and to do adequately uh, uh, individually. So I'm not so I'm not so sure that we need to to uh, if you were going to think about how to simplify this somewhat, I think that the target shouldn't be the numbers, which are cl clear and a good example. But maybe we don't really need to include the sentence that begins the difference between the number of deed restricted affordable units. And what that implies, if you just eliminated that and then just went directly to the shortage of affordable units is continuing concern, that that would that would say what you need to and and without belaboring unnecessarily the the uh, housing production plan. Or does this get at your concern? Yeah, I, I, I like, I, I agree with Mr. Hannon. Leaving in the last sentence is fine. Um, and then taking out the one you have there is great. Um, the data, the town's current housing production plan, that's, if, you, if that's what it is, I, I just wasn't sure that what that was outside of something we were considering for this hearing. But if that's what it is, Mr. Havity says, um, um, it's, town law, that's fine. Um, it's the nevertheless language down to the word, it's in blue, down to the word, the town, then it still would, I think might be a little bit more almost opinion than um, that I'm a little comfortable doing. I welcome everybody's thoughts. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Pat. Um, since, I mean, the, the main purpose of all of this was, was basically to emphasize that we're not conceding when we say that we're way short of the 10%. We're not conceding that we don't have safe harbor. So the important thing was to draw the distinction between um, 3B and, 3, and, and 3A. Um, that being, that being said, if, I mean, the numbers under the one important indication sentence, those numbers are already, are already there in the jurisdictional findings. So one would have a hard time falling on one sword to preserve numbers that are already in the, mm -hmm. the, the only thing that's different is, is the implication here that's drawn that this indicates how little and that the, the magnitude of the difference indicates indicates how big the problem is. And that is, but the underlying idea of that whole sentence is to draw the contrast so that you can see that if we, if we took that part out, um, then I don't think that there would be any great, any great difficulty. In other words, the one important indication sentence is sort of optional in my opinion. Yeah, because that's what I think I could be, I mean, just sort of editing it down. So, you know, one indication of the shortfall is the percentage of low and moderate income units as compared to the state subsides housing inventory. Right. Or you know, or just referencing back to, um, you know, the earlier section in the jurisdictional findings that, that about the town, you know, saying, you know, the one in, you know, the town falls short of meeting its own goals in affordable housing is presented in the jurisdictional, fi the jurisdictional findings or whatever those findings were. Excuse me. Mr. Chair.
Chairman, I would I would feel more comfortable just saying one important indication of the shortfall of affordable housing is the percentage of low and moderate income units as compared to the subsidized housing inventory, which was 5.64% as of 2016, and then leave the rest of it out, the, the fell far below the 10% and so forth. I mean, somebody can draw uh, their own conclusions about how mm -hmm. far off 5.64. The, the information is all there. It, it doesn't need to be belabored, I don't believe. I actually think that paragraph is a bit tighter now that it's with those changes. Mm -hmm. We just, the only other thing we still need to do is fill in this X. <laughs> right. Are we okay with that paragraph that is now? And Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. The only other question I have, is I'm not as up on this issue as you guys are, Mr. Hanlon, Mr. Revlick, is it, the town falls far short of meeting and comparing 5.6 versus the 10. Is do, do we need to say far or is it just short? Because I, I, I don't, I don't understand the, you know, the um, metrics on that. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. um, I think the truth is far short is almost an understatement, but I'm perfectly happy to take the that kind of word out. There's nothing else, paragraph one, I had a, I had a question in paragraph two. Um, which is just the first sentence we referenced 75 and older. And even though we do go back and notice that it's the project is 62 plus, mm -hmm. I was more sure this should be 62 as well. Or I think, I think that makes sense for consistency. Are people who are 62, are they considered seniors? Mr. Chairman, they are. Okay, thank you. I mean, the the question though is, I guess, it is for Mr. Revelak. Did the seventy five come from the housing production plan? That came from the original text of finding sixty eight. I see. Oh, okay. Mr. Chairman, I wonder why, if we necessarily have to have age 62 and older and just, why couldn't we just say seniors? That yeah, certainly works. Oops, but I do want to keep the word seniors. Come on. I'd ask Mr. Haverty if it's a deed rider or a deed restriction on the affordability. Deed restriction. Although it's, a, I mean, there is a deed rider that, that gets recorded. What number, you, what are you looking at here? It's just under paragraph two. Um, it's referencing the. The deed, deed rider is appropriate. It is a restriction, but it's called a deed rider. Okay. Perfect. And um, it should go without saying that the parenthetical note at the end of the paragraph can be struck. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's just lineage. We're just putting in bold. All right. Uh, 
graph three. There's 124 units. 25 such units affordable. as well. Paragraph four. Now four, we were talking possibly about locating elsewhere. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I in the suggestion that, that came out even at the very last minute on a, a section on climate change, this this language was included in that in that section. Travelac, does that seem reasonable? Uh, that seems entirely reasonable to me, Mr. Chair. Okay. Everyone comfortable with adding this in, these three paragraphs? Yes. No exception here. Okay. Goodbye, me. <clears throat> back to this document. If I do this without making the whole thing go nutty. You know, I'll take a little cleaning. All right, so that's our new affordable housing. So need for affordable housing, so we got affordable housing and flooding in wetlands. Does anybody care if it's wetlands and flooding or flooding and wetlands? Oh. When in doubt, alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then now it's in the same order that it was in this paragraph here. So flooding and wetland. So this paragraph here, I think we already relocated. Yeah. This is now gone. So do we need a new introductory paragraph? This is not to indicate specific language, but just that I think we, because we've relocated this introductory paragraph, we kind of need to put something back in its place. Mm. Have to work on that. Flood storage capacity over the years. This is all still good. Um, memorandum from Weston and Sampson. More voice track concerns. So for a statement, for a paragraph like this, where it starts to bring in questions about climate change, do we want to leave that here or do we want to 
relocate it to a section in regards to climate change. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I haven't fully done that, but I, but that is part of what the intention was, is to, I mean, essentially the organization with climate change is essentially that uh, with the NOAA 14 data that the, that the Conservation Commission requested, that the, the commission itself indicated it addresses the situation as it exists now. And it does not address the situation that existed um, or that is likely to exist with the continued exacerbation of, of the climate and with st storms in the future. That last part, I'm trying to get into the climate change part. And the first part I wanna, I'm trying to get here. And the Weston and Sampson paper is one of the major sources that we have for um, things getting worse and and why it is the NOAA 14 um, plus data only take you so far. So anyway, that's a long way of saying that I would that I'd like to to incorporate 24 into the climate change section. Okay. And I think 25 Well, actually, that's no. So that's current. So that goes. So that's not climate change related. Six. So at twenty six. Would we want to? 26, 27 are both sort of climate related. Yeah, there, there is a funny, a fuzzy line in this area between um, flooding and climate change. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hamlin. I'm not sure. I think the underlying point of 20, I don't know where all this came from. Um, you'll no doubt have to exclude the failing memory of an elderly person when I say I can't remember reviewing the climate Cambridge Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment and Flood Viewer, mm -hmm. but I'm sure I must have done that at some point. I've done practically everything else. Um, but the beginning in 26, my understanding of what that's for, and maybe Mr. Revelak can, or one of the others mm -hmm. can do this, but I think that what they're trying to do here is to demonstrate that, that the elevation of the first floor of the senior living building and the first floors of the duplexes are high enough to get above the existing 100 and 500 year flood elevations. So that essentially that's talking about, uh, well, some of it is talking about the future and some of it is talking about now. The underlying point is that they're high enough to be an appropriate response. I, I agree that that seem that that is that to me that comes across as a point. Um, it's all sort of the, the whole the, all the stormwater stuff is is you know it does get fuzzy between the current and the future. So the main thing about the current is that the stormwater management system is being designed to withstand storms based upon today's precipitation levels. Correct. That, that's really where the difference between present and future is. Now, dealing here with how high do the elevations need to be, that's important. Um, and I'm not quite sure how it fits. And maybe we should just go. I need. We need to go back to the to the drawing board on this. Although I certainly appreciate uh, Mr. Revelak taking a look, since mm -hmm. both by personal experience, and professional training, he's he's more adept at the stuff than I am. Not necessarily professional training. It's uh, it, actually not professional training. I just happen to live in a floodplain. <laughs> 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 the 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 very same floodplain, as a matter of fact. Um, at a slightly lower elevation. At a slightly lower elevation. Uh, my basement is 5.6 feet. So oh. um, 
<laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, we're getting it's getting a little bit late, and I'm wondering whether it's possible for us to move, to put this on a list of things to go back to. Mm -hmm. I think that the line between climate change and the current flooding problem mm -hmm. is a little harder than, right. than I first thought, and and I think that it's not a good use of our time to try to solve it solve it right now if we can if we yep. can do some other things no problem um so i believe 30 30 a sub a sub b i believe these are your as mr hanlon is that correct yes mr chairman i the, the those uh, that area excuse me the number eight this was this was added into the um, draft at the point when we made a new one for the public so that must have been i think october 13th mm -hmm. and we had the material from mr hessian that was supported by beta as well that goes into much more detail in response to our question to, to explain exactly what the flooding issue is um, and so this is basically the source of much of that. So the origin here comes from the applicant, but it's been reviewed by Beta, and Beta agreed with it. Okay. So the idea is that we would just sort of streamline these into into the into the findings. Yes, this is really the heart of what the current issue is, right? Yes. The the question is why do we have all this flooding that we do today? Uh, and this sort of sets forth several different reasons for flooding and where the problems appear to be. Um, and it would it, it, it would be the basis if we approve this, that certainly this this would be very important as to the reasons why. This one again. This is more climate. That'd be number twenty nine thirty should be it's good where it is. Mm -hmm. Thirty one is good. Thirty two. Thirty-two. I guess that belongs here. He starts talking about still about compensatory, as is thirty-three. Mm -hmm. Thirty-four. And jumping back quickly. So after we did flooding in wetlands, we were going to go on to climate change. I'm just going to drop a header. So Mr. Chairman, the, the section that was now called existing conditions in open space would yep. become the last section or would be incorporated into the, the final the final section about open space and management of the conservation land. Climate change would be traffic and transportation. That's where I put So we have 
So the management, the open space management conservation parcel is these parts here. Now, as a finding, do we want to include anything about the ongoing efforts to prepare a memorandum of understanding? Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Um, I actually think we should sleep on that. Uh, the, what I think is useful here, I mean, the, the, the uh, this whole structure is now organized in a sort of a signal response kind of way. And I think that when we find that the very last thing you should get to in the findings is an explanation for where this state of play is with the, with the MOU, the uncertainty that is there and what we have done to address the situation. Mm -hmm. So I would envision that there'd be something like that. Um, currently we have, a lot of, I mean, we had material about the applicant has proposed a series of things and reality has kind of moved beyond the applicant's proposal at this point. And we will have conditions that if there isn't an MOU, the conditions that we've imposed will be the ones that will take, that will take uh, uh, place. And a lot of people will be interested in that. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that it's important for us to say as clearly as we can, just the way in which we are dealing with the extremely strong interest in preserving open space and ensuring the appropriate management of this parcel um, with the uncertainty about the procedurally about how that will come about and how we're dealing with that uncertainty. So I think of that as a very strong um, finding sort of thing and would encourage putting us putting it in there. Okay. Um, was there a direct analogy to the neighborhood compatibility? Neighborhood compatibility, I think, is is one of the subjects in the revised thing. I I, I envision switching it in order with transportation to go from okay. wetlands to transportation and then to neighborhood compatibility, because as you'll see, the latter the last part of the transportation insert. Uh, would lead us naturally into talking about the overall compatibility, compatibility of the project with the neighbor. Transportation, okay. But that is no longer called the transportation network, but, yeah. and all of the text has been replaced by the insert that I've proposed to everyone. Just, just to be clear about it, because it's a little confusing, um, but late Sunday, I, or early Monday, I guess it was, the, I submitted um, a partial draft. I, oh, I, I'm, I'm losing track. There's a, the point is that there's a second draft that includes more than the first one that I shared at, at around the time of our last, or said I would share it around the time of the last meeting. So the one that you got, you, you need to check to see which is the most recent version. Now we have an existing section on civil engineering and site design. Would that be then divvied up among the other sections? Was that here? I think so. I think so. We'll have to look and see whether there's stuff left over that we need to, to find in there. But a lot of it is is similar. Okay. While you're in the area, Mr. Chair, I um, you, you might want to consider striking the old numbers 68 and 69 since uh, they've been relocated. Right. So Mr. Chairman, just to one thing that I think we'll struggle with and we'll probably get to next Monday um, is the provisions that are down here around 70 and 71. 
and we'll, we need, I think, to uh, consult with Mr. Haverty on, on that. Um, it, I'm not sure just how much we have to find in order to be able to approve this project. And the, this is written on the assumption that the project would be approved, but um, some bits of it, I mean, I, I, I have no basis for finding that, that what we're proposing to do makes, doesn't make the project uneconomic because we've been precluded really from having any, any data on that to begin with. So, you know, all we can say is whether it does or not, we think that it, that local concerns justify it. Um, and, you know, th this is a, they're light and shade in this, in this, they've done a lot and a lot has been required. And I think that they've made, not only have they made progress, but that this in some ways is, 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 is a, is a good project, but there are still things that, and that concern me. Um, and that I don't think that we can fix. And one of what one of them has to do with what is going to happen uh, in another 20 or 30 or 40 years when storms get more severe than they are now. And this project is probably more designed than many uh, to deal with that. But I can't see how any of us could be, could be uh, comfortable in in uh, envisioning envisioning that prospect nor am i very comfortable in, in envisioning the prospect for this neighborhood even if this project isn't built with the intensifying weather that is is in store it's it's a it's a huge problem and something that i think we have to to uh, to address so i i think that we ought to find as little as we can and still meet our obligations under the law and i would like is when we get to that, to have Mr. Averty uh, educate us as to what we must find and what is wordage verbiage that we don't really need. Well, it is 10 o'clock. Um, so we do have, um, a session scheduled for two nights from now on the 18th. Mm -hmm. um, that unfortunately, um, Mr. Haverty is unable to um, join us for. And then we have a meeting scheduled for the following Monday at eight. Um, again, with Mr. Haverty, where we were sort of hoping we might be in a position where we could um, you know, essentially be complete and be ready in time ready to vote um but sort of given the the nature of the findings at this point i'm a little nervous about being able to wrap them up on thursday and i'm just want to see what other people sort of thought about that i can certainly easily take a whack at reorganizing things and you know making the corrections that we had discussed earlier this evening but in terms of you know being comfortable with findings by the end, you know, by the end of the night on Thursday. Just curious what pe where people are feeling. I mean, my gut expectation is that we will, you know, need a portion of Monday. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I like to be an optimist, but I'm. I'm sh I'm sure we'll make good progress Thursday. I'm not quite con I'm skeptical that we'll be quite finished okay. or entirely finished. Mm -hmm. What do others think? Had we also set aside time potentially for Tuesday? So it's not currently on the agenda for Tuesday. Um, the thing with Tuesday is we already have like four other hearings. So we wouldn't, if we were to want to discuss anything in relation to this, it wouldn't be until, I mean, we, would, we could do it at 7.30 and delay everybody else, or it would not be really until after 10, 10.30. Yeah, that would not be ideal. No. 
Mr. Chairman. Yes, Pat. I wonder if just to preserve our options, we could put it on the agenda for Tuesday. And if we were finished on Monday, we wouldn't we we, we wouldn't have to to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you do it the other way around and you're and you're not finished on Monday, you have 48 hours before you can do anything again. And that brings us to Thanksgiving pretty much. So maybe we ought to at least reserve the time and and work hard at not needing it. Okay. I could certainly talk to talk to Rick about putting it on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, on Monday, had we set down eight o'clock? We have set eight o'clock on Monday. And what was the reason for that? I forgot. Mr. Mr. Ford has a prior commitment earlier. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. All right. So are we comfortable taking a taking a break from this at this stage? Yes. Yes. Okay, then I would go ahead and if I could have a motion to continue the meeting for Thorndike Place until Thursday, November 18th at 7:30 p.m. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Rebelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. So we are continued. Um, to go back, Did I? I don't know if I actually updated the slide with our schedule. Um, So this is the schedule coming up. So obviously this was tonight, was the 16th, Thursday at 7.30 is what we just continued to. Um, and that we had previously decided we would meet uh, Monday the 22nd at eight for Thorndike Place. Um, and then Tuesday the 23rd, we have Robbins Road, Highland Ave, Swan Place and Palmer Street. Um, and I will go ahead and ask Rick to put Thorndike Place on as a placeholder for that night as well, just in case. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to point out that um, for Tuesday's hearing, I'm going to have to recuse myself from Swan Place. Ah, okay. So just to make sure that there are enough folks here for that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and Mr. Chair, yes, sir. If we do add Thorndike Place on the agenda for the twenty third, mm -hmm. um, would there be an advantage, or would would there, would there be any practical advantage to starting at six thirty rather than seven thirty? Um, so no. we. Could start at six thirty with Thorndike Place if we wanted to. That that's what I was thinking. Six thirty with Thorndike Place, um, yeah, and then yeah, you because know, obviously the others have already been advertised for seven thirty. Correct. Um, Mr. Other... Chairman, I couldn't start early Thursday. I apologize. Yeah. Sorry about that. Nope. 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 And I'm not sure if Mr. Mr. Haverty would be is it available mm. or not. I am actually not available on the 23rd. I've got another hearing at seven. 
mm -hmm. put it on at the end of the agenda. I, I don't anticipate that I'll be later than eight or 8.30. So if you wanted to put it on the end of the agenda, I almost certainly will become available and I can switch over. Okay. We could text you if needed with that. Absolutely fine. Yep. <laughs> not, not make you sit through it. <laughs> That's fine. All right. And of course, hopefully we won't need to do it anyways. But. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you'll note after November 23rd, the next hearing date scheduled is December 21st. So we do, once we have that taken care of, we do have a fairly sizable break. What's our closing date for this? The so we need to be done date? by the 30th. Okay. So if on the 22nd, if we're really worried and we don't think the 23rd is going to do it, we could discuss pushing into that beginning of that following week. Um, the issues just being that is this start of Hanukkah, if that matters to people. Um, also that we did in our discussions with the applicant we did indicate that we had wanted to try to be done before thanksgiving i don't you know i, I would really rather stay away from holidays and stay away from um, pushing it to the absolute last moment mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, a key to all of this is to make November 18th count. Absolutely. And uh, we, we might, we have generally been stopping it around 10. Uh, we've been talking about procedure now for a few minutes, but we, we may need to go a little longer. You very well may need to. All right, that's our, that is our upcoming schedule. Anything further for tonight? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I wonder if, if someone could send us instructions as to what it is that we're supposed to do um, to restore the functionality to Zoom so that we can all see each other. We, we did okay tonight without it, but I have no, I mean, Ms. Ray did say that you had to update something, but my Zoom isn't calling for me to update anything and I'm not quite sure what it is I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I'm not sure what I would have done to be able to be on here. Um, I'm guessing that being the host made a, made a difference, it, it, but it can't be that you have to make all of us hosts in order to. Yeah. I, Mr. Chairman, I wondered too. I was on Zoom calls on my same computer all day today, so I, I, I didn't have any other issues. So, huh. yeah, usually, I was going to say usually for the uh, uh, option to update, I actually I have to sign in, and then after signing in to the Zoom app, uh, there's a little menu for check for updates. Yeah, Chairman, I don't really want to put, impose any real burden on anyone, but it, but if, if the town does know exactly what we're supposed to do, <laughs> if somebody could IT, IT or someone could just g give us a hint, that would that would make it easier for us to be ready to participate appropriately next time. Yeah, I, I can follow up with, with Kelly and Ben on that one. All right. Nothing else. I'll go ahead and conclude tonight's meeting. Thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially would like to thank Rick Ballarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Lanema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding that recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. 
And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. And Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Board. Aye. Chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Safe travels, Mr. Hammond. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. Good night.